Moses comes down and says, what are you doing? <laughs> and his brother, Aaron, Aaron. <laughs> he goes, well, we were just hanging out, and we had this fire, and everybody threw their gold in the fire, and this calf shows up. <laughs> it's like, right, Rambo. Okay, sure. <laughs> so Moses gets, gets very upset, and he breaks the, ten, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, and the whole law is written on. Scripture says it was written on both tablets, both sides, by the finger of God himself. So God wrote that with his finger on both sides of the tent. So when you watch the movie Ten Commandments, you see Charlton has to come down the come down the, the mountain with this thing and it has just these ten lines. Mm -mm. It's front and back, both tablets. How long? How big the tablets you think those were? Well he had to pack them. Yeah, he had to pack them. Yeah. <laughs> now in now just so you know, in the English or not the English, the in the Hebrew language, sometimes whole words can be a picture. So one letter could be a whole word. So God wrote the whole thing on both sides of the tablets. Moses goes back up. God rewrites it. It comes back down. From uh, the book of from Exodus, halfway through Numbers <coughs> is all the law. And God establishes his requirements for his people to live a life that we all know they didn't adhere to. And we're not going to go into all the things of the law because we could be here for days upon days talking about the different laws. Well, there's 600 and some laws. That, that's not including some of the Levitical laws and some of the other things. So there's a lot of regulations that God wrote down. God can do what God's going to do. I mean, nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> yeah, the entire law was written on those two tablets, front and back. It's in Scripture. Exodus. Read it. Can I just make a comment really quick? Please. you got to understand that the laws were written there, but some of the things you read in the Bible, like how to do things and whatnot, Maybe you think they're laws, but they're not. Moses was just given that by God to tell the people. Like how to, how to perform a certain service or, you know, the law of this, you've got to do that. Just part of that was there, and then Moses had the interpretation. Right. But yes, the, the requirements, the statutes that God gave them were on board those tablets. From there, they went to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barnea... T-H-E-T. <laughs> you asked me to spell that. <laughs> Don't look at me in that tone of voice, then. Say that slower. I started writing T-H-E-T. Kadesh Barnea. That's K-A-D-E-S-H. B A R N E A. And Kanish Barnea is a town that now it's one of those, it's just like Mount Sinai, it's not locatable anymore. It's, it was a spot on the map back then, and it's, now it's under sand. But that is the place where, when the children of Israel arrived, that Moses said, We're going to send some spies into the land to check it out. God has told me that this is the land flowing with milk and honey. I want to see what this land looks like. So we're going to send some spies into the land. We're going to send one spy from each tribe. To represent each tribe, we're going to send them in there. They're going to go in two by two, teams of two, and they are going to scout out the land for 40 days, and then they're going to come back and report to us. So for 40 days, the spies were in the land. They were checking it out. They came back. They brought evidence of good stuff. They brought... They brought some fruits, and they brought grapes on sticks, and they, they said, this is literally a land flowing of milk and honey. This is what God said it's supposed to be. However, there are these big guys that walk around in there. They're big guys, and they don't even have basketball courts invented yet. So what these guys did, we don't know. <laughs> So the, the giants freaked him out. 
And they're like, we cannot overtake these people. They're too big. Caleb and Joshua said, yeah, we can do this because God's on our side. Everybody else said, no, we can't do this. So the whole nation of Israel wept. They wept overnight. They wept the next day. They went to Moses and they said, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? So they refused to go in. And then God said, okay, because you refuse to go in, Numbers chapter 13 is where this is, where this is at, I'm going to let you hang out here for 40 more years. One year for every day that the spies were in the land. So that's where you get the 42 years in the, in the wilderness. Okay, say that again. One day. One year. One year. For every day that the spies were in the land. So the spies were in the land for 40 days. That means 40 years. They had to, more years, they had to wander through the desert. It took them two years to get to Kadesh Barnea, so two plus the 40 is 42 years the children of Israel wandered through the desert. So that's a kind of a misquote. We say, yeah, they wandered around for 40 years. Well, yeah, they did wander for 40 years, but actually 42, technically, if you want to. Okay, it took them two days to go to Kadesh Barnea. Two years to get to Kadesh Barnea. From, from the time they left Egypt to they get to Kadesh Barnea, which would normally take 11 days if you just walk there, it took them two years. To go from Egypt. Oh, okay. To go from Egypt through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, Kadesh Barnea. It took four years. Two years. Two years. Well, but normally it would be like an 11, it's 11 day, <laughs> it's only that far. <laughs> uh, they spent a year at Mount Sinai, and it took them 24 days to get to the Red Sea. The reason why it took them so long was God was preparing them to move into the Promised Land right off the bat. gave them the law before they continued on. So God always prepares us for something before we get there. Are we willing to pack it and go is the question. God's not going to say, go over there and I'll, once you get in there, then we'll, we'll talk. No, guys, no, God prepares you before you get there. So once you walk in, you can walk in with confidence like they walked out of Egypt. It's the paradise city where the grass is green and the grass are pretty. So for 40 more years, they wandered through the desert. And during that time, the first of the generation of 20 years up and older died. Mm -hmm. So those 20, uh, not 20 years old and younger, they're the ones that inhabited the land. <coughs> so let's fast forward 20 years. The children of Israel are moving in. Abraham, or excuse me, Moses cannot go into because God said, I'm sorry because you did not follow my directive back at the waters of Meribah, you smacked the rock instead of, walking, instead of talking to it. I'll let you see the land. So God takes them up on the mountain, shows them the land, and then takes them home. So Joshua is in charge. And this is the second time in history where we see God parting the water. Everybody talks about the Red Sea, but how many times do you hear the Jordan being parted? You don't hear the Jordan being parted very much. Jordan was in flood stage because it was harvest time, the first harvest, the spring harvest. There were two harvests in that part of, in that time, that area of the country, there's two harvests. The spring harvest was upon them. The Jordan River was in flood stage. God said, I want you to cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. Get ready to go. Now, what's really interesting, and I've said this before, is before before the children of Israel went in, God said, I want you to go to your tents, and I want you to consecrate yourself for three days. And when he says consecrate themselves, in other words, get with me, get yourself right, get in some prayer, find out where you're at, because we're going to go. So not only does God prepare us before he moves us along, but he wants us to prepare ourselves. Very, very important. 
if we're not prepared to take that extra step to keep going, then the preparation that God has put us through is going to be for naught until we get that preparation on ourselves. Like what Dr. Drew was talking about last night, those levels of, of, of Christianity. In order to move to that next level of Christianity, God is depositing into us what he wants in us to move forward, but we have the responsibility for ourselves to keep checking in, to make sure we're walking the way we're supposed to be walking. Okay. Children of Israel move into the promised land. Uh, approximately 1400 BCE. Approximately 1400 BCE. BCE again is? Before the Common Era. Very good. Before the Common Era. And we'll talk about later on the d dividing line between Common Era and Before Common Era. Because there is no zero year. It doesn't go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It just goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Can you imagine living in that, in that zero world? I was born in zero. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that's the dividing in the, the different historical events. We'll go into calendars later on. But um, it's not clear exactly where that dividing line is, but it's in the neighborhood of the birth of Jesus Christ. But we'll get there. So they enter the land, and God says, take the land, take the land. I want you to wipe everything out that's not of me. So start wiping things out because I'm going to go before you, and I'm going to start softening the people up so when you get there, you're going to take the land. They take Jericho. Everything's great. They go to the next one. They're sitting in the camp. They get defeated. They start freaking out. Oh, no. This is bigger than we thought. Well, they're sitting in the camp. They find the sin in the camp, take care of the sin in the camp, and they move on. What's interesting is the nation of Israel, they see these miraculous works of God. They see the victories. They see the fact that he sustained them in the in the wilderness. He fed them manna for 42 years. He fed them, even when they complained about the uh, quail, he fed them too much quail. You know, they got sick of it. <laughs> I thought they never got to eat it. They did. They ate it, they got sick of it, and God said, in fact, I'm going to make them eat it so it comes out of their nose. Yeah, it just, they're going to they're gonna be so tired of quail. So, yeah, they didn't get to eat that. Oh, no, they did eat that, and they were tired of it. So they said, okay, we'll stick with manna. Sorry, God. Never complain about the provision the Father gives you. Amen. Amen. Never complain about the provision the God gives you. Anyway, moving. So they're in the land, and they fail to wipe out what God told them to do. So there were still little pockets of other people, other lives and civilizations within the promised land. And that's how idolatry started creeping in while they were in the promised land. That's how idolatry got into their lifestyle because they didn't go and eradicate everything and start fresh and new. Now, there's a little, little something. Sometimes that's okay with God. And here's why. Because God said those, those individuals that they didn't wipe out, God caused them to stay when they didn't wipe them out, to test them, to cause them to learn how to fight. Judges talks about that. If we didn't have any resistance in our walk, we would be stuck at level one, two, or three. We would never move on to four, five, six, seven, and eight. Because there would be no working. There would be no, as Paul writes in, in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, I'm your source of strength but you need to work it out. Because in Philippians, what they were doing was they were relying on Paul to be their spiritual daddy. So they were sitting there sucking their thumb. Well, Paul, Paul, what do I do? Paul, what do I do? Paul, what do I do? And Paul was like, I'm giving you everything you need. You guys work this out. Yeah, I can sit. I can advise. I can tell you 
where you might be going. Just keep it within the ditches, between the ditches, guys, and go on. But just don't come to me with everything. Work out your own salvation. Start strengthening yourself. Move from that milk to the meat. Hebrews writes, I want to give you some meat, but you got to get the milk first. Okay? Boom, boom. <laughs> so anyway, God left those people in the land to teach the Israelites how to fight. So they eventually occupy the promised land. Joshua passes, Caleb passes, and then come the time of the judges. And what happens was, for 450 to 500 years, the nation of Israel is up and down spiritually. They have a great victory. Gideon leads them to victory over the Midianites. 600 men against 100,000. Great. God is awesome. God is good. We worship God. We tear down all the idols. We tear down all the temples of the enemy. We are worshiping God. Well, then a few years later, threads of idolatry come creeping in. So they're up here spiritually, and then they're back down here spiritually. And God says, okay, you're going to live with the consequences of what you're doing. So they get attacked, or an enemy comes and rises up against them. So they cry out to God, and God sends a deliverer, a judge. So they go, and they have a great victory, and they're back up here, and they're worshiping God again. And it's all God. Yay, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then over time, it starts going back down. So it's a roller coaster for 450 to 500 years. You've got great judges like Deborah, like Gideon, like Samson. Yes, Samson was a great judge. He went sideways when he fell in love with Delilah. I'm sorry? We all go sideways when we fall in Yes, we all go sideways. But however, a lot of times when we do go sideways, we learn from that. Yes. You know, like what Dr. True was saying last night, God doesn't use recycled people. He uses renewed people. So yeah, this was the re a renewing on, on a number of people. So you have the time of the judges. And it goes all the way till the prophets. And then now we're going to start hearing some of the prophets. And how the prophets work in the Old Testament. By the way, the first prophet, or the last judge, was Samuel, who was also the first prophet. Samuel, the last judge, the first prophet. And Samuel was very important in the early kings of the nation of Israel. How a, uh, a prophet did their thing. Yeah. Just to let you know, I am not an artist. I draw stick figures. And I have trouble with stick figures. Okay? This is a prophet. Okay? Okay? There. Now, when a prophet kind of looks ahead, what it's like us when we go to the hills, or we're here in the valley and we're looking at the the mountain or the, the coast range over there, or Mount Hood over there, or the or Mount Jefferson that direction. What we do, well, a lot of times we see is we'll see the mountain, and then we'll see another mountain, and we'll see another mountain behind it. Okay? The prophet, what he's doing is he's looking. And he's seeing the tops of each of these mountains. So when he writes stuff and he reports stuff to his people, he says, yeah, this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. And many times in Scripture, you'll find where a prophet's going to say, this is going to happen to you. However, this is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who's going to come. However, this is the glorified Israel, the glorified kingdom, this is the end times. Usually that's the pattern that happens in Scripture with prophets. They tell what's going to happen to the people or the person inquiring, either it be the king or the people. But then they also talk about Jesus Christ. But then they also talk about the kingdom in heaven. What they don't see is this here, the low spots. Yeah, you're going to do this, but we're not going to tell you here because you're not going to see that. Follow? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when someone says, oh yeah, that prophecy is for me. Well where, well, where does that fit in here, first of all? And two, how do you know it's not something down here that the prophet doesn't see? So with the prophets in the Old Testament, that's, that's kind of their view. 
that always was looking towards Jesus Christ and then further beyond Jesus Christ to the kingdom. That's very, very important to keep in mind. You've got to keep in mind that scripture, especially the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, except for the book of Job, Ruth, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Psalms, is the history of the Jewish people. <coughs> The, the whole book of or the whole Old Testament minus the poetry books Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and maybe Ruth, possibly, because that's just a single story. But what about Esther? Esther is a very important okay. it's not a prophetic book. It's, a, it's an important book on the history of the Jewish people. We'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll touch on that. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I, could you back up? You said the Old Testament is what is a history is a is a is a history of the Jewish people, with the exception of Thank you. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Every other one has a history of what the Jewish people is doing. Job falls in, he's kind of a contemporary of um, Abraham. While Abraham's life is going on in Canaan, Job and his stuff is going on somewhere close by. Scripture isn't <coughs> clear as to where it's happened. But what is clear is, <laughs> this is the coolest part of Job. Nothing that the enemy wants to do to you can he do unless he has express permission from the Most High Lord God? First mm -hmm. The first two chapters in Job show us that the enemy just can't go around wreaking havoc. Because that's what he does. You know, when, when God says, um, when, see, what have you been doing today? He says, oh, I've just been going to and fro, crossing the earth. What he's saying is, I'm just being me. I'm just killing and destroying. That's what I do. Stealing, killing, destroying, because that's what Satan does. So that's what I'm doing, killing, stealing, destroying. And God says, have you considered my, my servant Job? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing that the enemy wants to do to you can he do unless there's permission from God. We see that in the Old Testament. Remember when I said Scripture backs itself up? In the New Testament, just before Jesus was, was arrested, Peter said something, and Jesus said, Peter, the enemy has asked to have you, and when he said you, it's plural, so all of you, sifted, sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. The enemy still asks today, God, check out your servant Jeff down there. I'm, I'm going I'm to mess his life up. God's like, no, I got him. So a lot of times when we think it's an attack of the enemy, it's just life. Because Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. He didn't say in this world you will have attacks from the enemy. He said you will have trouble. So there's a, diff there's a difference in there. And one of those steps of 6, 7, 8, 9 of a believer is to recognize what is actually attack and what's just life. The armor of God, I'll touch on this really quick. The armor of God, Paul says, put it on. Well, everyday life has the boots and the belt and the breastplate anyway. That's stuff that's got to go on every day. If I don't wear my belt, guess what? <laughs> if I don't wear my shoes, my feet are sore. <coughs> Same thing. That's stuff that's got to go on every day. Let's continue. <coughs> we'll take a break here in a few minutes. Moving into the kings. First king was Saul. Can I ask one question? You said yes. the judges were here for four or five hundred years. How long were the prophets? The prophets started at the end of the of the of the judges, and they the prophets were up until oh until the children of Israel came back into the land after captivity. So you've got them you've got a approximately, let's see, I imagine, well. Solomon or, or Solomon was around a thousand or thousand beasts. So um, 
Prophets were around for probably 1,000, 1,200 years, somewhere in there. Now, when I say prophets, I mean someone that kind of spoke. The job of the prophet and the job of the priest, you know the difference between the two? The priest went to God on behalf of the people. The prophet went to the people on behalf of God. So when Hebrews says that we are prophets and priests, we have a dual responsibility. So in other words, we're priests. So we, I can say, I'm going to go to prayer, go to prayer for Jeff. That's my priestly role when I go into prayer for you. But then when I get that rhema word, I'll say, hey, I got something. That's the prophet. Prophet, priest, and kings were royalty. Were royalty. Psalm 8 says we've been crowned with royalty. So walk in your crowning every day. Okay, continuing on. So Saul was the first king. He was head and shoulders above everyone else, Scripture says. That doesn't talk about his dandruff problem. He was head and shoulders above everyone. <laughs> He was, he was a handsome guy. He was from the tri tribe of Benjamin. And God says, okay, you've been wanting the king for so long. I'll give you the king. And it's like a little, sometimes, you know, little kids, they keep bugging you. Can I have it? Can I have it? Can I have it? Can I have it? We know as parents, you don't need that. But sometimes they've got to taste the poison in order to understand it's not good for them. So it's exactly what happened. The nation of Israel said, I want, we want a king. God says, okay. They learned that the king was not the right thing because God wanted to be their king. But they wanted somebody on earth like all the other countries in the area did. So Saul was king. And this is the first time a leader, except for the, um, uh, the judges, when the judges did something mighty, the Spirit of God fell upon them. But when a king was anointed by the prophet, the Spirit of God came upon them. So they were, they were um, anointed by the Holy Spirit upon um, anointment from the prophet. That's why in Psalm 51, when David says, Take not your Holy Spirit from me, he was afraid he was going to lose his anointing because he was found out from his sin. He's like, Oh! God, I'm so sorry. Don't please don't take your anointing from me. I need that. He understood the importance of that anointing that Samuel had over him, the Holy Spirit. So Saul, then David, then Solomon. After Solomon, then things get a little bit, they start going downhill again for the most for permanently almost not permanently, but for the rest of the Old Testament for the nation of Israel. What had happened was in 1 Kings chapter 11, Solomon decides that he is going to do his own thing. Even though God appeared to him twice, Scripture says, Solomon says, I'm going to start worshiping idols. I'm going to start marrying whomever I want to marry, how many I want. I, don't, I never understood that. He was, he was labeled the wisest man in the world, but he had a thousand wives. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not the wisest thing to do. <laughs> so at that point in time, God said, I am going to tear the kingdom from you. But because I made a covenant with your father David, it's not going to be in your lifetime. But your sons are going to go through this. So there's two sons that are the dividing point for the nation of Israel. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Write those down. Can you spell those, please? That'll be nice, sister. Thank you. <laughs> Rehoboam is R-E-H-O-B-O-A-M and Jeroboam is J-E-R-A-B-O-A-M. J-E-R-A? Yeah. B O A M, Jeroboam. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. If you want a little more information on those guys, 
like I said, feel free to research that, those guys. Jeroboam followed the Lord in what he wanted, in what he was doing. Rehoboam despised God. And at the death of his father Solomon, he went to his advisors and said, what do I do with these people? And they said, do just like your father did. Treat them well. Be respectful. And he said, no, I'm going to be cruel and wicked over them. He fell into idolatry. And from that point on, any king that is labeled as a wicked king in the book of First and Second Kings, they always say they did not follow the Lord and they went into idolatry just like Rehoboam did. So they always compare it back to Rehoboam. Always. Jeroboam followed the Lord. That divided the nation of Israel into two tribes from the south, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Okay, so Rehoboam and Jeroboam are the same people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's the division for the land for the nation of Israel. And that divided it from the north and the south. Yes. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Who was Jeroboam? Solomon's other son. Both oh, of them they were, were brothers. They were brothers. Oh, yes. Wow. I apologize for making that clear. Okay, so I'm sorry. Okay. So this is the division of what? The nation of Israel. Thank you. Where it was the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. Judah and Benjamin were south, and all the other ten tribes were north. And I'm just going to sit and make that easier, ten tribes minus Judah and Benjamin, instead of trying to rattle off all the other ten names. And these are Solomon's sons? Yes, Rehoboam and Jeroboam are Solomon's two sons. Mm -hmm. Which one was older, Rehoboam? Uh, yes. Nope. Which one is older? Research that out for sure. Judah and Benjamin were the north tribes. South tribes. South. And the other ten tribes were the northern kingdom. Say it again for south. Judah, tribe of Judah, tribe of Benjamin. divided today and we'll get into that after our break. Yes, this is a really good breaking point right now is the division of the kingdom. So, why don't you guys take about 10-ish in there somewhere? Um, there's still some grub back there. It's coffee to wake up. If you need to make more, please make more.